Alaska. It's unlike any other state in the U.S. A vast frozen wilderness stretching from above the Arctic Circle over 1,400 miles south. It's America's last frontier. Big, rugged, and cold. 60 below zero, dark out. We come to work in the dark, we go home in the dark. It's always dark. Even surviving here takes an arsenal of unique tools, engineered by Alaskans, to take on this ultimate state of extremes. There are Alaska solutions for Alaska problems. If you didn't have an Alaska as a test ground, then you would have invented one. It's Alaska Tech, now on Modern Marvels. As a land of extremes, Alaska delivers in a big way. On size alone, it tops the charts. Twice the square footage of Texas, with 33,000 miles of shoreline. The state could stretch all the way from Florida to California. Its landscape makes for epic forces of nature and the coldest temperatures in the US, down to 80 below zero in some parts. 39 mountain ranges and over half of the world's glaciers separate communities into the most isolated in the country. In most of the state, there are only two seasons, 10 months of winter and two months of thaw. Both of them wreak havoc on the roads. Alaska's highway system serves just a third of the state, with only 5,600 miles of roads. That's the same amount as in Vermont, yet Alaska is 62 times bigger. No road is more critical than this north-south lifeline, the Richardson Highway, which brings oil and supplies from the southern coast into Alaska's interior. But this highway is also home to Thompson Pass, a 2,800-foot gap in the Chugosh Mountains, which just so happens to be the snowiest place in Alaska. The all-time record for snowfall here? 974 inches. And its yearly average is over 500 inches, more than 41 feet, enough to bury a four-story building. Then there are the avalanches, which average 20 per year. It wasn't until 1950 that snowplows even attempted to keep the pass open year round. But ever since, a specialized team of DOT drivers rotates through 20 hour shifts, facing whiteouts day and night. We do our best to keep the roads open but sometimes it's just really nasty and, you know, Alaskans are tough. You can't tell them, you know, you can't tell them it's bad and expect them to go home. So how can these drivers keep plowing through such treacherous conditions? With a new groundbreaking GPS navigation system that allows them to steer through a virtual moving map of the highway. Our truck's antenna communicates with a fixed ground antenna to determine the truck's position on the road within three centimeters. The GPS is really like having a sixth sense. When your vision goes away, you still have the GPS to show you where you are. The map appears on a monitor in the back of the cab, which is reflected onto an acrylic screen, kind of like a see-through video game monitor. This way, drivers can watch the screen and the road at the same time. The driver's truck appears as a white square on the screen. The center line, intersections, mile markers, turn lanes, guardrails, and avalanche zones are all marked. The way the system works is if I start to move too far to the left and cross over the center line, the yellow center line will turn red, letting me know that I've gone too far to the left. And the same thing if I go too far to the right, the white fog line will turn red, letting me know I'm going too far to the right. The GPS unit is also equipped with other warning sensors. We also have a seat function I can turn on, which will uh, vibrate the left side of my seat as I travel over the center line. And again, if I go too far to the right and start to travel over the fog line, it will vibrate the right side of my seat. 
too far to the left at the wrong moment could mean a head-on collision with a semi. But radar enables the system to pick up the location of other vehicles, so drivers know when to make room for a truck that's about to pass and when to slow down for an obstruction ahead. It's a major advancement in reducing driver stress and fatigue on the job. These trucks are basically one-man armies. They really have reduced the amount of time that we have to spend in our graders removing snowpack, and uh, they're really an impressive vehicle. Plow trucks do their part to keep the roads open throughout Alaska's winters. But keeping your own car on the road is a whole other battle. Most cars are simply not built to operate at temperatures down to 60 below. And the danger of breaking down in these conditions can't be overestimated. You're fighting the cold weather. You're fighting your vehicle. You know, we got to say, you know, Mother Nature, because she can be a frigid bitch up here. Ken Boschert runs his car shop out of Fairbanks, where everyone knows he's the man to see about winterizing a vehicle. Because here, even a daily commute can quickly become a matter of life and death. A buddy of mine went to the gym, broke down on his way home from the gym. He's still in his shorts. He goes to walk home, he makes it, but he frostbit his foot, and he actually lost a toe. So now he's got four toes on one foot. Simple thing, just driving home from the gym. 50 below one night. It can happen. Every year, Ken spends the summer outfitting cars with Alaska-tested cold fighting kits. The first challenge would be to actually just get the car running. You got to get started every morning. And, and it's, it's 60 below zero, batteries don't work. And so if you don't have your car winterized with a whole bunch of heaters on it, it's not going to do nothing. So we got one of these four-way boxes, plugs into your house on this end. And what we do is we mount this under the hood in a nice place so it doesn't get dirty or wet. And then these are silicone pad heaters. They do different jobs. The silicone pads are glued onto specific parts of the engine to keep it warm. Here is a 100-watt silicone pad heater, and it's glued right onto the oil pan. All right, here we see the cord coming up front. Glue it right on the automatic transmission pan. And you can put it in gear, and the transmission actually lets the, the vehicle move. One that's a 600 watt, it's a freeze plug heater and it heats all the coolant in the engine. This is the one that does most of the work and it just gets blistering hot. Just a little heater element. Fits right in the, just fits right in the coolant jacket and bolts in. When all four of Ken's heaters are working properly, they fool the engine into thinking that it's operating at a temperature of about 50 above zero. But once the car is running, it still has obstacles to contend with on the road. You need some great tires like these. These are great tires, big tires. But if you notice in here, it's all these, see all these little cuts? This is called siping. And these little cuts get you extra traction on the ice because they'll, they'll expand out and they'll just, they'll actually just take a little bite of that ice and help pull you along and help keep your steering and braking good so you can stay on the road. As if the cold and ice weren't enough. Remember, it's, it's dark out all the time. It's just, it's just dark. We come to work in the dark, we go home in the dark. It's always dark. And that's not all drivers face. The moose in Alaska are the biggest of their species. And every year, four to 500 get killed in car accidents, taking some people out with them. So it's great to have moose lights, big safety features, not just to look cool. They, they actually have a purpose. They, they not only look cool, but it's a safety issue. Keeping your truck running is important in the towns and cities. But the majority of the state is not even accessible by roads. So to really stay mobile through the winters up here, you've got to winterize your plane. There are things that Alaskans know very well. Snow is one of them. Flying in snow is another. And that requires landing on snow. If I have skis on, the world is my runway in the middle of winter if I have skis. I can land on snow anywhere. Airglass is Alaska's leading manufacturer of landing skis for all kinds of aircraft, from military helicopters to single-engine Cessnas. An engineer named Wes Landis started the company in 1954 out of his Anchorage garage. He changed the game for aircraft skis by using the cutting-edge material Airglass still uses today, fiberglass. Some of the helicopters we make skis for in the military hold up to 55,000 pounds. So, 
The technology has driven how do we make those skis, how do we make them light, how do we make them functional. For some of their products, Airglass uses a new, highly durable fiberglass composite called Twintex. It's basically indestructible. It's very flexible, um, and it's very good for impact resistance, which is what um, aircraft skis typically run into, is a lot of, you know, pounding on the snow and ice. Tom Lawhorn and Joe Wittishek are one of the expert teams who make each pair of skis by hand. And our, our largest single cost is labor. And because it's highly skilled and it's all hand done, we wouldn't have it any other way. Today, the team is making skis that will fit up to a 4,000-pound Cessna. The process starts at the vacuum mold. The team uses suction to help pull the flexible fabric tightly into shape. They layer a total of eight sheets of fiberglass into a mold. The mold goes into an oven, where the composite bakes until the layers liquefy and bond together. As it cools, it solidifies into shape as one rigid piece. It may not look like it, but this piece of fiberglass is much stronger than a similar sized piece of wood. Which is what pilots were stuck with before World War II inspired innovations in landing gear in Alaska. The breakthrough was sparked by an invasion that most of us in the rest of the US tend to forget. In June 1942, Japanese soldiers landed on Alaska's Aleutian Islands starting a grueling 15-month air war, the first armed invasion of American soil since the War of 1812. With so few runways in Alaska, planes that could land on water soon held the edge. But their aluminum floats had some problems on snow. When fiberglass became available after the war, Wes Landis was inspired to see what this new material could do for snow landings. Turns out, a lot. Tom and Joe are now ready to join the top and bottom halves of the ski together, using a powerful resin. After a few hours, the ski is ready for its hardware and rigging. Um, this is a completed LH4000. Uh, the hardware is on it. It has a completed bottom. It's been trimmed to the final size. One of Airglass's unique designs is a hydraulic door that allows skis to be attached to the landing gear alongside the wheels. In the early days before each flight, pilots had to choose wheels or skis. Now they can select either option while in flight. A big plus for safety and another example of homegrown innovation. So I do believe Made in Alaska, designed in Alaska by people that are flying in Alaska makes a big difference. On this tech journey through America's last frontier, we've seen some of the unique tools Alaskans use to keep moving through relentless cold and ice. But that is just the tip of the iceberg. Alaskans also face a host of other natural extremes. Because when Mother Nature hits here, she hits big. Take earthquakes. Of the 15 strongest quakes ever recorded worldwide, three were in Alaska, including a colossal 9.2 earthquake that devastated Anchorage in 1964. It's still the second largest earthquake ever recorded. After the earthquakes, frequently come the killer waves. As the shaking earth causes underwater landslides that push massive walls of water toward land. In 1958, a super tsunami, the largest wave ever known, exploded in Latuya Bay in Alaska's Panhandle. At 1,720 feet, the wave was more than 50 times taller than the one that hit Japan in 2011. Fortunately, it struck an unpopulated area, but it uprooted millions of trees on mountaintops that still lay bare today. If that weren't enough, there's also Alaska's more explosive adversaries. The state has more than 40 active volcanoes. We have 
um, several eruptions per decade compared to the lower 48 where we have you know, a, a few eruptions per century. So a lot of action up here. Rick Wessels monitors volcanoes as part of a team at the Alaska Volcano Observatory. It depends on the volcano. Every volcano is a different beast. So we respond slightly differently to each one. The team uses seismic instruments, gas analysis, and satellite imagery to detect movement and temperature changes on Alaska's active volcanoes. One big clue is midwinter in Alaska, of course, is usually frozen solid at these elevations of these volcanoes. But all of a sudden, we're starting to see liquid water near the top of the volcano. There's water flowing, which doesn't happen in the winter unless something else is going on, like the volcano heating up. That's currently happening on Cleveland Volcano in the Aleutian Islands. Its recent rise in temperature has crews keeping careful watch around the clock. If there were a big um, eruption cloud in any one of these volcanoes, including the ones we're focusing on, which is Cleveland Volcano right here, we'd actually be able to see that develop. And this data is captured about every 15 minutes. Monitoring the data daily is crucial, especially for pilots. Thousands of planes fly these northern skies every day, including large commercial jets with international destinations. A giant ash cloud would endanger them all. For example, in 1987, Redoubt Volcano erupted about 100 miles from Anchorage's airport. When a KLM 747 jet flew through the ash cloud, all four engines failed. The plane fell 14,000 feet before the captain could restart the engines and land. Miraculously, no lives were lost, but the near tragedy cost $80 million in damages. To avoid future accidents, geologist Christy Wallace is seeking a better understanding of ash clouds. What we know about ash clouds is that um, they contain glass shards, mineral fragments, and rock fragments. And all of those together can be very abrasive. But Christie has found that the glass content is what's most dangerous to aviation. And that glass can melt at operating temperatures of jet engines. Which can disable a plane in minutes. Christie's study will determine where and when it's safe to fly after an eruption to avoid unnecessary grounding of air traffic. That's huge in Alaska where without planes, many residents are totally cut off from basic needs. Eighty percent of Alaskan villages are not accessible by road. Planes deliver mail, groceries, and medicine. They get children to school and the sick to the hospital. When you dial 911 for an ambulance, you don't get a car, you get a small airplane. But Alaska is also one of the most dangerous places to fly. We used to kill one pilot every nine days in Alaska and have one major accident every three days. A challenging flying in Alaska due to the terrain and, and uh, changing weather conditions and lack of aviation infrastructure you know, in general. The standard radar technology relied on by pilots in the lower 48 has never even existed here. It's too difficult to install and maintain in the vast remote areas of the state. In Alaska, within 10 minutes flying time, you are out in a place where you know, no man has actually walked, and no buildings or infrastructure is available. Without radar, until recently, pilots here had only one tool for navigation, their eyesight. That's why airplane accident rates in Alaska were five times higher than in the rest of the country. To save lives, the Alaska aviation industry collaborated with the FAA to develop a new state-of-the-art piloting technology. Called the Capstone Program, this system uses GPS instead of radar to constantly update pilots on flying conditions. Pilots access the information from a single screen on their dashboard. The navigation function keeps them on their flight path, while a continuous weather uplink informs them of Alaska's constantly changing climate conditions. The traffic feature enables a plane to transmit its position and receive other aircraft positions via GPS and ground stations. It's a vast improvement to just looking out the window. The terrain display is a piloting feature totally unique to Alaska. A majority of accidents here are referred to as CFIT, 
or controlled flight into terrain. That means crashing into a mountain you didn't know was there. This is a good example out the front window. Even though the, the sun's out, you can still see snow fields on the bottom with the white clouds a little on top, and you can't really tell where the clouds stop and where the terrain starts. Now the capstone system sees it for you. Color coding indicates changes in terrain heights around you as you fly. Anything green is 2,000 feet below. Yellow is within 500 feet. And red is at or above your altitude. So in the red, you're dead. With constantly updated information at their fingertips, pilots here fly much safer skies. In just one year with the new system, Alaska's aviation accident rate dropped 47%. It's a far, far safer place than it used to be. By 2020, the FAA plans to equip the lower 48 with the second generation of this system, aptly calling it NextGen. A uh, flying environment in Alaska was a perfect place to test out the new technology. Uh, if you didn't have an Alaska to, as a test ground, then you would have invented one. We've seen how tough a subarctic environment can be on cars and trucks. But what about the roads they drive on? It turns out the biggest threat to Alaska's highways lies beneath them in the form of permafrost. Permafrost is ice-rich soil that forms just below the surface and has been frozen for at least two years. It covers 25 million kilometers of our planet, yet most of us have never seen it. But in Alaska, it can't be escaped. Permafrost blankets 80% of the state. It lies under most of Alaska's roads and highways, providing a hard base. That is, until it melts. Permafrost as so long as it's frozen, it's good stable stuff, right? But once it thaws, it's water-saturated goo where the water runs away. Dr. Matthew Sturm studies permafrost at the Cold Regions Research and Engineering Lab near Fairbanks. The lab is actually a tunnel, the only one of its kind, providing a rare window into what Alaskan engineers are up against. So we know that permafrost is, is soil or rock and, and ice, but often it's hard to see the ice in there. Here's a good place to see the fact that there's a lot of ice. There are several types of ice features that can exist within permafrost, often layered on top of each other in columns that can be up to 1,000 feet deep. So the column we, you know, we're looking at here, it's mostly water. You wouldn't build a road on a lake that was frozen and expect it to survive that spring, right? That's information Alaskans could have used before building their highway system, since most of the roads run through the most problematic permafrost region, creating relentless road hazards. Mike Coffey heads up the Alaska DOT Maintenance Division. His massive road repair operation comes with a hefty price tag. We spend 10 to 12 million because that's what we have available to do the work. If we had $20 million, we'd be spending $20 million. Year after year, crews spend the short summer months patching cracks and gaping holes in the roads and leveling out what they refer to as the roller coaster effect. It's a never ending game of catch up. We're basically, you know, the band aid on the big problem. So the big goal is to find new ways to stop the thawing before it starts. So the interesting thing for engineers in Alaska is we're basically in the refrigeration business. We try to keep the ground frozen to keep the structure on top of it stable. So this may look like a big pile of rocks, but it's actually a state-of-the-art air conditioning system. For the ground, it's called an air convection embankment, or ACE rock system. The concept of the ACE rock is it's all 6 to 12 inch rock and there's a lot of voids in it. And so what it allows is air circulation during the winter time. The weight of the road causes the ground below it to heat up. Rather than trapping all that heat in the soil, the hot air can now rise up through the voids between the rocks, while the cold air from above is drawn into the ground, keeping the permafrost frozen below. So we have to try and be proactive and, and learn 
on our own because it's our problem. Permafrost's unstable surface presents similar problems for Alaska's construction industry. Building projects, like this hospital in Nome, face a sobering challenge. A large building can generate enough heat to accelerate the permafrost's thawing significantly. That means buildings often buckle and cave into collapsed ground. The solution? Place the building on pilings to keep these monster heat sources off the ground and allow for circulation in between. 40 to 60 foot pilings are driven deep into the soil. This pile is vertical. It's essentially a, what we call a friction pile. It's held in the ground by the friction of the ground. But friction only works when the ground is frozen. And eventually, the surrounding permafrost soil will start to thaw. They got to bring in the big guns. So we don't need a big area frozen, but we need the area around that pile frozen. So that's why you'll see a thermal siphon adjacent to every pile. A thermosiphon is a tube driven into the ground, in this case, near each piling. Liquid carbon dioxide fills the bottom of the tube, which absorbs heat from the earth until it boils. The resulting vapor rises to the top of the tube and passes through cooling fins before it's released into the air. This keeps the nearby ground temperatures well below freezing, so the permafrost can't melt, and gives the building a good chance to survive. 50 years or more. But if permafrost is a challenge to build on, it's virtually impossible to build through. To install water and sewage pipes in Alaska, building crews need to dig down at least six feet under the permafrost layer. If they lay the pipe any closer to the permafrost, it could get crushed when the thaw sets in. That lens will thaw out of there and then um, will create a void and then the ground sinks. And when that happens, that's no good for pipe, because what will happen is the pipe will sink. Just getting the water to flow to your tap brings on another set of challenges. Water systems in the lower 48 states have pipes full of stagnant water, ready to be released at the turn of a tap. But in some towns in Alaska, where temperatures frequently dip as low as 60 below, how do they keep water pipes from freezing and bursting? The trick? Constant circulation. In Arctic towns, the power plant maintains a minimum input of 100 gallons of water coming in from wells at all times. It's heated here and then runs through town and back in a continuous loop 24-7. As long as the water keeps moving, it won't freeze. And Alaskans can get water out of their taps through record-breaking cold. Alaska's permafrost means nothing is simple here. Even straightening up the house takes on a whole new meaning. Over time, many homes built on permafrost soil start to sink into the ground haphazardly. As ice wedges below thaw, the soil disappears. And houses have nowhere to go but down. To fight back against the thaw, some Alaskans raise their houses on stilts. But gradual sinking is inevitable. So homeowners have to level their houses periodically to adjust for the disappearing ground. It's not surprising that the increasing rate of thawing due to climate change has scientists and engineers worried for Alaska's future. So we always thought that permafrost, even in a warming climate, would thaw very slowly. We'd have time to respond. You know, if we've got 200 years to respond, we're going to be OK. But if we've got two decades, we're not. If most climate scientists are right, Alaskans will have to make some major changes in the years ahead to be able to survive on the tundra. The hardy souls that choose to live in Alaska relish the challenge of extreme weather. But residents of the isolated town of Nome take this to a whole new level. This small town lies on the Seward Peninsula, just off the coast of the Bering Sea. 
Its subarctic climate makes for long, grueling winters and short, cool summers. There's no state road into Nome, so the town's 3,500 residents live totally cut off from ground access in or out. Planes are the only motorized way to get supplies in, except during the short summer months, when Nomers rely heavily on barges. There's a large variety of items that come in on the barge. Just about anything you see down in the lower 48, you wouldn't think twice about running down the street, but uh, we have to think ahead and plan ahead and have it barged in. Without the barges to bring us the main material, the cargo and the fuel that we need, it would be much more difficult to function here and to develop and build. Building projects here face an extremely limited working window before winter sets in. The urgency has picked up. We're now in overdrive. This is uh, September, and what you didn't get done in September, there are going to be some projects you're just going to have to wait until next year. This hospital construction project is nearing completion, but there's still much left to do, so crews are working overtime. They're building an addition to Nome's Hospital, first constructed almost a century ago, and probably the most famous hospital in Alaska. It was here in 1925 that victims of diphtheria came for treatment, sparking an epidemic that nearly wiped out the entire population of Nome. The only available medicine was in Anchorage, but brutal weather made flying it in impossible. So the life-saving serum traveled partway by train, and then, resourceful Alaskans turned to their last resort, dog sleds. A heroic team effort included 20 mushers and over 100 dogs, relaying across 674 miles of frozen tundra. In five and a half days, they delivered the vaccine to the hospital in time to save many children from death. This epic journey launched Alaska's most famous sporting event, the Iditarod. Every year, the race brings together mushers from around the world to retrace the course from Anchorage to Nome. Mushers know that a quality sled can make you or break you. So many of Alaska's finest turned to Bernie Willis, a seasoned sled maker whose unique designs have led many to victory. The function of a sled over the snow has never changed. So what I've tried to do is adapt modern materials to the traditional function of a sled over the snow. Bernie's sleds work just as effectively for everyday use, as sleds remain a common mode of transportation in remote parts of the state. There are quite a few people in Alaska that use sleds out of necessity. Bernie's sleds are constructed piece by piece for maximum performance. Inspired by the design of downhill skis, Bernie builds runners that are tapered and consist of several strips of wood, unlike traditional runners shaped from one thick piece. I don't know of any other dog sled makers that use the wedge piece. Then he reinforces his runners with two layers of fiberglass. The fabric he uses for the sled's bed decreases drag to keep the momentum moving forward. It was inspired by his days of flying airplanes. I was sitting in the cockpit of the Alaska Airlines jet one day, and I saw the baggage cart go by and saw the curtains flopping against the suitcases. And I thought, that material is really strong. I bet that would work as a sled bed. Bernie also uses plastic and rubber from bicycle tires to give a musher extra traction on his sled. Design updates like these pay off for a musher running a long, treacherous course. Some have increased their speeds by 10% with his sleds. So we have a smoother riding, faster sled now than, than we have for years. 
Sled makers like Bernie work feverishly through the summer to get deliveries out in time for the winter racing season. But just because there's no snow in those months doesn't mean mushers stop training. Many, like Nils Hahn, use creative tactics to keep their dog teams in top shape during the off season. They just love to run, so whenever they are hooked up to a tug line and a neck line and have a harness on them, you know, it's ingrained in them where they want to just pull as hard as they can. That's the case whether they're pulling a sled or an ATV. The dogs are hooked up in their sled configuration, six pairs of two. Nils uses his brakes to control their speed, but the rest of the job is up to the dogs. So four-wheelers, you know, it's pretty noisy and pretty bumpy, but it's also very, very handy for, for dog training. Muddy summer trails are rougher than the nicely groomed ones they run in winter. So if Nils can keep his team at a four-minute mile for two hours in these conditions, he knows the dogs will be able to do it in a race. Despite the challenges that come with its terrain and weather, Alaska remains a land of opportunity for those armed with the right tools. In coastal towns like Nome, specialized boats are key to the summer economy. Between June and September, Nome Harbor is full of them. Some out for fish, but plenty of others for gold. We normally think of California as home to the big American gold rush, but Alaska's heyday lasted almost four times longer, spanning close to 40 years. The area around Nome became a hotbed of gold prospecting in 1898, when gold was discovered in the beaches along the Bering Sea. 28,000 people flocked to Nome for their shot at wealth. Since then, over five million ounces of gold have been found in this area. And there's still much more to be had if you're willing to spend the time and money to look. John Manns concentrates on offshore gold mining. His dredging vessel is a customized pontoon boat, which he's modified for maximum gold sucking power. John and his dredging partner dive whenever weather allows, always exploring new parts of the sea. This is about where I first started last year, my first time out here in this ocean. OK, well, let's do set anchor right here and see what that does. Dredging is the process of sucking up sections of the ocean floor. It's the most efficient way to extract gold here. John's attached a powerful engine to an 8-inch hose, turning it into a giant vacuum. Simple, but dangerous equipment. These hoses are 40, 45, 50 foot long. And they, when they're full of water and gravel, they, it's like uh, slaying a dragon. You're pretty much on the losing end if it takes, if it takes control of you. As sand, dirt, and rocks are sucked up from the ocean floor, they're sent through a series of compartments and filters below the boat. There, the gold settles out from the rest of the material and gets filtered down into its pure form. Owning a dredge is a big investment. Building one costs at least $50,000, and operating each year is another $50,000. But with the value of gold so high, the potential for payoff is great. In 2011, gold was up around $1,800 an ounce, making dredging a lucrative business for someone like John. My best days in gold mining was 38 ounces, and I made that in like 15 minutes. It's no wonder they're calling the latest influx of gold seekers a modern gold rush for no. Even those who can't invest in a dredging business can turn a profit. Many, like Buddy, spend the summers combing Gnome's beaches instead, using a portable gold-finding contraption called a rocker box. Rocker boxes were around in the early days, but thanks to modern additions like a generator and a pump hose, Buddy can work much more efficiently. 
Before picking a spot, Buddy checks for sand that shows a visible sign of gold. Yeah, I'm just trying to peel back the layer. See the red? That's the pay streak right there. That's what you're looking for. You go, you when you prospect, you pan it to see how much gold is in it. And if it's good enough, you then you do like I'm doing right now. Shovel it into the beach box and, and recover the gold from it. The filtering process is similar to that on the dredge. The bigger rocks get sifted out, while the spray bars wash the remaining dirt and sand. It falls through to a metal grate called a ripple board, which creates a whirlpool effect from the running water. As water flows over the grate and back to sea, lighter sand and dirt go with it. Gold is heavier, so instead it gets pulled down and trapped by the astroturf material below. Finally, Buddy carefully pans through small amounts of what's left in order to extract the valuable gold nuggets. Cleaning just one tablespoon of material can take him up to an hour. Buddy hasn't hit a huge payday yet, but for him, searching is half the fun. It's a hobby. The peace of mind that comes along with being here, looking at the ocean, here in the waves, is just phenomenal. The hunt for gold is one of many opportunities in this extreme state that has lured people for decades. Though its volatile land creates challenges for those who live here, their innovative solutions prove that with a strong will and a can-do attitude, you can make it and thrive in our frontier state.